Welcome back to another podcast. This is Comments from the Couch, The Squash Show. We're here today in Chicago, the windy city. It is pretty cold, but I've experienced a lot worse. Um, We have a guest today, our first guest ever on the podcast. We're all very excited about this. I hope you are too. But first, I'd like to introduce my, my partner, my partner in crime, partner in crime, and a fellow squash player that is the man from down under, Pistol Pilly Cameron. Hello, great to be here. Great to be here, Bobby, for another episode of the Squash Show. It's always great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So, without further ado, should we introduce our guest? Please. Okay, our guest today is no, none other, no other, none other than female superstar. X World number two, anyone guessing? Um, Jenny Dunkoff. Hello. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome. Pleasure to be here. What an honour. First guest. Are you, are you nervous? I'm slightly. I'm slightly <laughs> apprehensive. I'm not sure what you've got in store for me. Oh, all God. sorts. We have got all sorts in store. It um, it feels a little bit strange because we're now around a round table with three of us. So uh, crowd, perhaps. Hopefully, yeah. we hopefully don't. Not, but... Hopefully, we don't talk over each other too much. We'll try not ah. to. One. Um, but no, lots to look forward to in this show today. Um, firstly, should we kick off with the listeners' questions? Let's briefly mention the topics. Um, one of the topics we wanted to mention today was life after professional sport. Um, we had a very interesting couple of days, the last two days, um, at the Squash University, which is an, an initiative set up by the PSA Foundation. Um, to explore opportunities for squash players um, when they finish playing or putting ideas into place while they're still playing. So we had a good couple of days of forums with some great panellists and that gave us, I guess, the idea to talk about life after professional sport. And I've been lucky enough to work with Jenny the last the last few months on trying to uh, help her with that. But we'll come on to that later. Um, something to look forward to in the show. But firstly... Cameron has some interesting questions for Jenny. <laughs> Don't look so scared, I Jenny. I like the sound of that little laugh. <laughs> 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 Cameron, take it away. Okay, we have some listeners' questions. Well, straight in there. <laughs> straight in, straight in. Okay, so off Twitter, uh, comments from the couch, the squash show, we have from... Denny Bland. Don't trust any of these usernames. Or yeah. Danny, Danny or Denny? Or... Denny, Denny Bland and at blah blah bland. Right. So Denny Boy, he's got a question. Uh, what, if any, is the difference between a show court and a proper court? And I'm assuming by proper court, <laughs> he means traditional squash court. Yeah. Um, what, if any, what do you find the difference? Uh, there's a few, as, as we all know. Uh, my preference would be a show court. I think most professional players would say that obviously you're in usually luckily in our sport it's quite a cool arena if you've got the four glass walls of show court and we've got events in the pyramids the grand central station so the sense of occasion is always a lot grander playing on a show court and in terms of the actual court uh, the glass court tends to take a shot a little bit better so it'll stay in the corners um, lower and but it can also be quite fast off the front wall at times. All the show courts do differ, but generally they can be almost fast off the front wall, but dead in the corners, if that makes sense, yeah. compared to the traditional courts can be a bit spongier. Um, yeah. There's a lot more distractions on a show court, but you do become accustomed to that once you And you really get it. you really get rewarded for that shot, don't you? Yeah. You sort of if you hit that good drop shot it stays there. Yeah, so you can if you're playing well it's brilliant, but if you're not it can be it can, <laughs> it get, can be a pretty <laughs> can be a nightmare. Scary place Stuck to behind be, yeah. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> All right, nice. There you go, Danny Boy. Uh, moving on to the next one from Alex Betts. He would like to know how do we stop the court getting wiped because of a few drops of sweat? Great if you're knackered, appalling if you've got your opponent knackered, crap for the spectators. <laughs> so it sounds like Alex isn't too happy with the old... Doesn't like the stoppages. <laughs> um, it's a good question. Alex can... actually sweats a lot. I've played with Alex before. Doubles. Oh, yeah. yeah, good doubles player. He's a sweater. He's a sweater. We all sweater. Um, I mean, is there any way to to get around that I mean it's an interesting question I, I I mean I don't want to step in on on this one but it's an interesting one because you don't want to stop people diving I, I feel like that's part of the the fun of, of watching some great rallies also 
it's a hard sport and we just need to figure out a way of um, dealing dealing with mm. it because it's nothing worse than having a great rally and then having to stop when someone slips on a bit of sweat or sees the sweat and then has the ability to stop. Yeah, it does lose a bit of momentum and flair of the game. I understand that. But you've got to be safe as well, unfortunately. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, but sometimes I think the refs could be a little quicker at times to spot when someone's kind of possibly using it as a little bit of a break but it's very hard to say no I'm not going to allow that when there's generally at least one or two yeah. spots on the floor the safety issue is pretty big isn't it I mean you don't want to be I mean a couple of players in the past I think was it Tommy Richards a few years ago in Switzerland back corner back left corner oh, massive yeah. lunge yeah that was Ripped that was nice yeah. yeah Darwish did it as well in Saudi those two are yeah. weren't, weren't nice injuries yeah. at all who would you say are the biggest sweaters on tour oh um, well, Rosner. Rosner. I always, he comes up in every podcast. I've got to stop saying his <laughs> name. Um, Kempy used to sweat a hell of a lot. Jonathan Kemp Bozza, from England. Didn't he used to, Stuart Boswell. Bozza, yeah. yeah. Then he finally brought himself to put a headband on his head and that stopped <laughs> a little bit. He, he thought he looked like an idiot, so he just he didn't wear it for years. <laughs> yeah. right, girl's side, come on. I'm trying to think. Joel sweats a bit. And, uh, Joel King... Um, does she wear a headband or not? No. no she probably should, though, Can't shouldn't she? Sort it out. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Not, not anyone really springs to mind too much. Noran Goha, there we go. I reckon she's up there. Okay. Yeah. Could be number and one. She wears a headband too, doesn't she? Yeah. yeah. I've seen her do solo practice, just hitting backhand drives from the back corner and then left like a puddle. I mean, she hits it with quite... Yeah, that's true. She puts, every, <laughs> puts everything into yeah. it. Nice, nice. Okay, there we go. Uh... Third and final question. Okay. Uh, I've got one as well. Okay. Yeah. This one from Paul Robinson. Do you know Robbo? No, but it sounds like a proper yeah. name. So yep. well done. Yep. <laughs> actual person, actual human being. Yeah, not, not a robot. Twitter <laughs> bot. Okay. Who is the fittest player you've ever shared the court with? I know that most professionals are incredibly conditioned, but who stands out as having a good engine? Good engine? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, most of the players are pretty fit. But I'd have to be pretty boring and say uh, Nicole David played her so many times over the years, and not just her engine, but like natural athletic ability is just ridiculous. Her speed off the mark, and for girls, often we're not always the quickest at turning, but Nicole David, I'd say her, and perhaps Natalie Grinham actually back in the day in terms of elasticity and you can send Nicole the wrong way but she literally like a rubber person and would just she'll just turn, just and turn around back. whereas a lot of even the top players once you've sent them the wrong way they don't always recover whereas Nicole had the speed speed off the mark um, and then general just you know yeah. endurance was yeah was always pretty pretty strong yeah she's got to be the first one that comes to mind for me as well mm. yeah very good engine Bobby um on the men's game, you got a good engine on you, mate. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can go for a while. A few five yeah. 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 Oh, oh, humble over there. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm. I'm in the wrong era, to be honest. I think I would have done quite well back in the day. Um, Wouldn't rack it there. Yeah, I think so. Like I, I, sort of tests I've done, I can get to a good level and then sustain it for a long period of time. I'm not someone that can go to a really high level and and then I'll drop off. I can't get to that highest level of like intensity, mm. but I can get to like a medium level and then I can keep it going for a long time. So engine-wise, yeah, I'm a, I'm a good old diesel, diesel, Mercedes diesel, like 300,000 <laughs> miler. Um, <laughs> Solid. But I'm trying to think of others. I mean, en- engine's different to obviously being mm. quick and yeah. people that could keep going the longest. There was a lot, I mean... Joey, Joey was a fit boy. Joey Barrington obviously had good good engine on him. He could keep going forever, I think, at the pace he played. Um, Razik. Razik was a fit boy. Razik. He never got tired. Yeah, he yeah, he was one of the longest matches, didn't he? Yeah, he was just a nightmare to play on any sort of panel court because you really couldn't get him tired at all. He is so light on his feet. And I think that helps. If you're a good mover, I think it helps you to be able to move around the court mm. for a long period of time. Um, and he weighs 50 kilos exactly <laughs> which which always help but um thinking of top players i mean most of the top players their their strength is their their speed and you know they never used to get drawn into long attritional battles because their squash was so good they could finish rallies whenever they wanted obviously pete nickel had a 
good phenomenal engine. Energy, yeah. engine. He could he could keep going for a very long time. I watched him ghost for probably an hour non-stop <laughs> once, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd say anyone Cam- you can say. I'd say um, Cassina, he's, he's got a good engine. Yeah. Because he looks, he looks buggered in the first game. Like, <laughs> end of the first game, I'm, you know, if I'm playing him, I'm thinking, oh, I've made him do so much work here. Like, look at him, he's just hanging on. Next, you know, he'll grind out a 3-2 win. Or, yeah. But he just, he keeps getting balls back. And yeah. you think he's done and he's hanging on and he just keeps going and going. So I think that he pops in my head. Very good the, engine. The current crop. Yeah. Mm. Um, did, you, did you have a question? Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, only because we discussed it on a previous podcast. I don't know if you've listened to this this podcast. I know you listened to one, I Jen. listened to the second one. Okay, so just mm. skip the first one. Um, it might Was it on the first one or the second one? But anyway, we, we were discussing um, Nicole being dominant for the, the period of time that she was world number one for. And obviously you were world number two for a lot of that lot of that time. So when we discussed it, we were discussing what was it like to be world number two? What was it like to go to a tournament and know that the person who was world number one on whose number one seed was so dominant and not unbeatable, but very yeah. tough to beat? Like, how was your mental state going into that? Well, you know, you must have had some good matches and tough matches yeah, with it. Yeah, I mean, it's... I'm not going to lie, it's very difficult um, having played one particular person so many times and not really got a win over her for a number of years. I mean, Nicole and I uh, played, she's only eight months younger than me, so I've lost her quite a few times. In From a very young age, yeah. Up British Junior Opens. Um, do, do you know your head-to-head? Do you know roughly? Uh, I try to forget it, but I've got... How many no, wins I have you don't. got? I've got no. two wins. Two wins. Two wins. That's, that's um, yeah, not hard to count those right? two wins. Um, but I was just relieved to get the first one because part of it is belief as well when you've been knocked back so many times. I've actually spoken to a few years ago anyway, I spoke to James Allstrop about it a bit because he has obviously got a, he's on the back end of a few losses to Nick. Um, and it is, it's, it's hard to keep on backing yourself and backing yourself and there's still that bit in the back of your mind like, hang on, realistically, I've like tried everything I can do here, different approaches, different tactics. Yeah, you, you try different tactics. The win, yeah. yeah. Um, even within a game, you think, one minute I'm thinking, oh, sod it, I'm going to try and go for winners and then you hit the tin and then you're like, right, I'm going to just rally it out, be patient and you're thinking she can do this for about two <laughs> days long. <laughs> so it's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, but when you do get that win, it gives you obviously a lot of belief and, and you realise you can do it. So then the next stage is, it helps obviously the next few times you play her. But yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. And at the time when in our era, in our heyday, uh, Nicole's obviously dropped a bit in the last couple of years. Um, she literally would very rarely lose. A bad season for her was losing twice, which is which, ridiculous. Uh, no, it is, rid- it is ridiculous, it. I know. And um, it was pretty dull for the squash world. Like every, we, it was like, who's going to be runner up? Or it was yep. like, oh, and Nicole's won a 50th title or whatever we did mention that when i mean we said it it's a lot more interesting now because yeah. you've got any one of eight ten fifteen girls that can win a tournament which makes it a lot more exciting um not to say that nicole's feats weren't absolutely incredible which they were yeah. but definitely more exciting to watch yeah now. so much more exciting and the the standard of the top top ten top five ten players in the world is ridiculous and any one of them on their day can win. I mean, Shabini's pretty consistent, to be fair. Um, she's won five tournaments this season already. Uh, but it it is kind of interesting, see, having played Nicole for so many years and when she's been so dominant, to see her now having to try and figure out yeah. how to play since the low tin. That's been a massive factor. I was just about to come on to that, actually. The last thing on this topic I wanted to talk about was about how you feel the low tin has changed made made the women's game better I don't know what, what's your thoughts on I that I personally think it's definitely made it better I mean we don't even talk about it really anymore uh, nobody particularly likes change and I don't want to talk about Nicole too much I hope she doesn't listen <laughs> she's a big fan of the podcast. she's a big yeah, fan yeah. she's tweeting in all the time yeah, non-stop um, Nicole please stop tweeting it's, it's, it's really irritating now but her, I mean, she was number one in the world or whatever when we actually changed from traditional scoring to 11 she didn't want to change that, which you'd understand uh, when you've got such a good good record. Yeah, of course. And then the low tin, 
most of the girls were all for it, uh, probably because we thought it might give us a chance of beating Nicole. <laughs> but what else can we change? Yeah, yeah. Let's change anything. <laughs> Nicole was against it. Um, and I do feel a bit for Nicole and that, that has definitely... She's kind of tried to change her game a little bit around it. And she's had to, but it's not her natural game to try and... As a local Just if you can hear a fire engine... Don't worry about it. It's something, <laughs> something going off outside. It's, it's just it's normal. Fine. <laughs> Um, but no, the girls are such good athletes now, and I think we've had to improve the mobility around the court with the low tin and the shots that are going in are, are great. And yeah, I think it's brilliant. It's so so dynamic and exciting to watch. Mm. Excellent. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the listeners' questions. Um, we move on. Okay, so on to our first topic, which is life after professional sport. Now, sitting in this room. We have three Masters players. We are all over 35, we're all old, but do not get depressed. A wealth of experience. I'm just about to bang my head on the table. Yeah, don't, please, please don't. <laughs> this to is, jump out on the window. <laughs> There's a whole new world out there for us. Um, after reading some articles online, um, I thought this was going to be a great topic for us, obviously because we are all coming towards the end of our careers, but also... Obviously, wanted to speak to you, Jenny, because you've started um, a new career, uh, as I have. Pilly, mm. we'll, we'll come on to the other side so of it. Where... Still in the wilderness, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, because let's be honest, it's, it's a tough subject. It's a tough subject because you're going to have to. You don't have to, but you have the possibility of changing career completely after doing something you love for 15 years or even 20 mm. years, mm. and the scary thought of then having to do something completely different because your body won't allow you to carry on what you would love doing um, is an interesting topic. It is, it is. And like I said, we're all 35. So even though squash players' careers have sort of, yeah, 35, 36. What's Nick? 37. 37. So you can play longer, but we're at that time where we are thinking about what are we going to do. Um, I'm in the wilderness. I still don't know. Uh, well, that's that's a fair that's a fair position to be in. You, you asked me the same question a year ago, I would have had exactly the same mm, answer. Mm. And you touched on the the PSA Foundation earlier, and I think that's a great initiative, and it's good to see. Actually, there was two days of it, and you could see it was a good mix of the young young players just come on tour where they're like, okay, I just want to see what's what's available. Um, Guys, guys and girls halfway through their career when they're like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's going well, but I might need to think about it and, and the older crew like us. So that was pretty worthwhile and it was a good, good look into the business side of the world, um, which potentially we're stepping into very soon. I mean, do you have any idea what you would like to do if you could choose anything if i could choose anything <laughs> obviously not just <laughs> i want to be a play millionaire for the <laughs> <laughs> play for the rabbit yeah, sure. just in your rabbit eyes just hook me up. Yeah. um <clears throat> i mean it'd be good to stay involved with squash um it you know i'd like to coach at some stage top juniors aspiring pros or pros that that sort of that sort of target area um on the flip side of that there's you know, it's a tough market in terms of making money as well. It's, you know, you can get a job with a federation or you can start your own academy or, or look into things like that, but it's it's a pretty tough tough thing to sort of sustain, you know, your, your family's income on. Um, it's hard work. Yeah. It's hard work. I, I know my sister runs uh, our academy um, and she works absolutely tooth and nail and doesn't have many days off and she's the norwegian national coach she's indeed yeah Yeah. so i just uh, it's it's a lot of hard work it's a lot of um you get a lot of nice feelings when you see kids playing squash and and improving um but that side of it if you want to stay in the sport for us we're we're limited a little bit in terms of yeah we can coach but do you necessarily become a good coach just because you're a good player do you enjoy coaching is another one because some days I enjoy coaching, other days I absolutely hate it. So to think of doing that as a career mm. to carry on it is tough. It is um, tough. And you see some of the coaches, like my brother's a coach in yep. Calgary and the hours that you're literally on court all day. And being a squash player, we obviously work really hard, um, but in a way it's a bit of a 
selfish way of life you kind of look after you, you I mean I don't like to think I'm selfish at all but everything kind of revolves around your training and there's also a lot of downtime so the thought of actually having to get up at 6 a.m to coach someone and then finish yeah. at 6 p.m is I'm not even sure I can do that yeah. <laughs> I don't I mean, know yeah. if I've not had yeah. to do it before it's yeah. tough a lot, a lot of coaches spend a lot of hours yeah. on court we, we might only spend two hours on court a day training and you know because there's only so so hard you can push your body in one day but then they might have to do admin as well so yeah. if you're at the club from six till nine which happens quite a lot as your brother mm. probably knows then it's um it's a tough it's a tough life mm. very fulfilling at times but it's not an easy job so not that you know not that we we're saying we want an easy life after mm. squash but oh, i do yeah, <laughs> I, I want an easy life. You just want you want to win the lottery. That's yeah, why you haven't chosen yet. I think oh, that's part of it, isn't it. Oh mate, oh, I'm in the I, lotto. I'm in the lotto in Denmark. I bought my first ticket the other week. Oh, <laughs> of Euro con- millions. Good. I've Didn't con- win. Oh, keep keep trying. <laughs> Got to be in to win it. I've convinced my wife Lena that we're going to win a big chunk on the lotto at some stage in our lives, and she's not having any of it. She's like, Cameron, it's a waste of money. Oh, you, you know, I'm staying in. <laughs> you know the odds, right? Oh, don't tell oh, me. Don't, no, don't be a downer. <laughs> All right, sorry. So much negativity. It is, well, it's, it's, it's a tough subject. <laughs> it is tough. Like, I remember when I was in my 20s and people would say, oh, what's the longevity of a, of a squash player? And I'd always say, oh, yeah, everyone sort of, I'll probably retire early to mid 30s. And then I'm like 32 thinking I'm nowhere near retirement. <laughs> I'm 35 and I'm thinking, crikey. I c- Still kicking on. <laughs> well, trying hardly, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's daunting as well. It, there's a lot of... I think the first thing, I guess, once you hit your early 30s is almost accepting that... This is the last gonna, phase. Yeah, like, I used to get quite... And a lot of players do. You get a little bit defensive. As soon as you hit 30, you feel like you're playing quite well, you're still training well, and but then every second interview, they're asking you, when are you going to retire? And yeah. you, you get a mm. bit like... Well, hang on a minute, I'm just actually playing all right here. Just because I'm 31 doesn't mean I have to retire. And especially when you yeah. see the likes of Nick and Greg and, and you guys, and a lot of us are still old and still plugging away. But at the yeah. same time, you need to accept that yeah. a bit of forward thinking wouldn't go amiss. Def- ha- hasn't definitely always needed. been my, um, my forte. forte yeah, but. So let's quickly touch on what you'd like to do or what you're currently trying to embark on. Yeah, um... I'm enjoying doing the MCing, as you know, my manager, Bobby. I know, um, I know. <laughs> working hard behind He's the scenes. Hooking me up with a few gigs here and very, there. Very, I'm impressed though, very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, Yeah. It's, that's been really good fun. I mean, it's not something that I've grown up thinking I'd love to be a sports presenter or anything like that, but when I think about it, I do, I love all sports. Um, I watch a lot of sport um, and I enjoy, weirdly, it's kind of, it's us being squash players there's a lot of excitement a lot of adrenaline being out in an arena kind of entertain trying to entertain crowds um i've only done three events but you still get that little adrenaline rush before you go out go out there and you're welcoming people to whatever event it is interviewing the players um which i genuinely enjoy because a lot of a lot of the players have obviously grown up with or have seen them when they were younger, the likes of Kamisa, um, Raneem, I was probably world number two and I was playing them in first rounds and I could, I, I was winning but I could see the potential and it's nice to kind of see them complete their sort of, their playing personalities and see them grown, grown women and best players in the world yeah. and it's interesting. Um, so it's nice to still be part of the sport but from a slightly different angle mm. a lot of the time i'm still wishing i was on, on there playing <laughs> yeah i was gonna i was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna tricky, touch on yeah. it um i was gonna touch it only because that's obviously another aspect uh, aside from the how do we support ourselves and families financially and what other careers do we go into from a squash playing perspective are we gonna miss it i mean i think i'm gonna miss the the big the big matches and the adrenaline you get when you are playing a big match in front of a good crowd um, I'm probably not going to miss the travelling and leaving your family at home. That's that's the bit I find the toughest at the moment. But um, the, you know, it's not to say I don't enjoy travelling. I've always enjoyed the travelling. Um, but obviously, with the way the tour works, we come back to the same cities a lot of the time, and it can become a little bit of of Groundhog Day, especially when you've been on tour as long as as long as we have. So, um, 
what do you how do you find mm. how do you find it i mean the it's tough yeah i mean i think the things i'll miss i mean i won't miss the putting your body through the daily grind like yeah. five five days a week or yeah. six I mean, these days is not that much, but no, five or six days. No, no, I, can <laughs> still talk up there. <laughs> I can see the way you're you, you're moving around. I mean, I thought the ambulance was coming for you there for oh, a minute. <laughs> the way you just hobbled to the air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> Glad the listeners can't see that. Um, I won't miss that daily grind of just caning your body like yeah. every day. Um, won't miss that at all. I mean, the like you touched on before, just that that sort of adrenaline buzz where you're playing in front of that big crowd and you might have an awesome match and then, you know, you look around, everyone's on their feet just applauding the match, whether you win or lose. Like, I think that type of experience is going to be, I mean, it's, yeah. you, you can't replicate it, can you? Not at all, no. Um, I don't think so. I think that's what a lot of athletes from other sports have really struggled with as well. I mean, football is a prime example because the, the crowds they play in front of and the adrenaline they get from maybe scoring a goal... I can't imagine how that would feel to yeah, play in front yeah. of 50, 60,000 people all wanting you to score that goal. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you're the person to score it and then being able to celebrate with your teammates, with your fans, and that noise and buzz and adrenaline, I mean, I think for me that would probably beat the squash buzz by like tenfold. So mm. to go from that much for high yeah. to then not being able to play anymore, I understand the articles that I read about athletes having and suffering from depression after they finish i mean Absolutely. you know i hope that doesn't happen to any squash players but it's something that's real and something that people need to talk about and put out there because it happens and i can understand it happening i can see it happening like hopefully it doesn't happen to myself but yeah it, you know it could happen mm. there's mm. no no reason why it wouldn't i've tried recently um because retirement probably isn't too far away and and i do worry that i'm going to miss something that I've played my entire life and I'm a bit nervous as to how it's going to feel um, and one way I've tried to look at it is to, to think of how exciting it is once I finish playing squash all the things I can perhaps do that I was never able to do stay in the country for more than like, two, <laughs> two weeks at a time um, you know play a bit of hockey that I used to love when yep. I was a kid mm. um, different things that you've always had to sacrifice and so I'm trying to think of it in a positive way of everything else I can enjoy a bit more normality and then see how long that lasts for before I wish I was playing <laughs> tournaments again. Well, I think but, with, with the adrenaline buzz, what you said earlier about, you know, with your emceeing and presenting and, you know, you're standing there in front of the crowd that even though you're not playing in it, you're standing there presenting, emceeing, introducing the players. Like, do you think that would not almost replace it because you, you, you get that buzz, don't you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've not done loads of it, as I say, but yeah, it's definitely um, the adrenaline. There's a crowd there. It's not the same as playing, obviously, but it's not, you're not kind of... All eyes are on you. Yeah, all eyes are on you, yeah. um, which I don't always like, but I'm getting more used to it. <laughs> um, and then even with coaching, I was talking to my stepdad, DP, the other day, and which I'd never thought about before, but we're all competitive, aren't we? But And he was saying, like, even as a coach um you kind of get the the competitiveness is still there like through the players as well yeah. so you'll be sat watching a player you might coach and you still get that he's saying you still get that bit of competitiveness mm. through through coaching even as well that's that's um, good to hear that, yeah. that, that that side you know coming from a, a a coach like dp who's coached world champions as we know that he still gets that buzz in yeah. that situation that's that's quite cool I can imagine it. I can imagine if, if say, me and you were sitting there, I was coaching one kid yeah. and he was like my protege and then you were coaching yours. It would be like even worse rivalry yeah. than it is now. Well, it's, it's worse off court, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, a oh, little pilly protege. Yeah, yeah. Where are you? <laughs> yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. You have to beat him. <laughs> Daryl's his coach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got eight grand riding on this. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that's an interesting one from a coach's mm. point of view as well. Because mm. it's, yeah, there's different ways of getting that buzz, I guess. It can never replicate it, as you say, but there's different ways of, of trying to um, trying to get a little bit of it back. Mm. Um, but yeah, as you, as, you, as you touched on, the positive sides of stopping playing and retiring is that it does allow you to do 
loads of other things that you might want to do. Like I've always wanted to run a marathon. Now, when I stop, then I can actually do that without wasn't, fear of getting horrifically wasn't there injured. Wasn't a time that you almost did? You just set off running once. <laughs> <laughs> just you that's a story for another time. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, that's on, that's part of my stuff. mental health problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I am. Um, a little deeper into that. Why did you keep running? No, that's a good question. I mean, you can ask uh, Forrest Gump's my uh, <laughs> idol. Was running. Yeah. Um, but no, I read. Um, I read a fair fair amount, and I was reading a book called Born to Run um, and Ultra Marathon Man. Great book. Yeah, you read that. Great De- book. Dean Kazanes. Yeah. Um, so he, oh, I'll go into it briefly because it's very interesting. But um, he he basically hit thirty. So this is interesting because it actually does touch upon what we were talking about. He hit 30 and it was a life-changing moment for him. And he was working a normal job and he was out on the town with his mates. And he hit 30 and all suddenly dawned on him that he, wanted, that he wasn't doing anything with his life and he wanted to do something. So he went out the bar and he ran. <laughs> and he just ran. And he was an unfit guy and he just ran. And he called his wife at like 2.30 in the morning and he'd run 15 miles away. And she was like, how have you got, what have you done? And he's like, no, no, I just ran. I'm just, and he, and he and said he had this. His, still in his going out stuff. Yeah, still in his going out no stuff. Way. No trainers or anything. And, um, and so it turns out that he eventually then loved running and became one of the best ultra marathon runners in the world. So he's, wow. that's a hundred miles. So the last, not to spoil the book, but it, he sort of runs a whole marathon to get to the start line of an ultra marathon to then do it. And, it, and there's loads of other feats that he did that are really, really phenomenal. Anyway, after reading this, I'm like, right, I, I need to run. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> so um, literally on a Monday morning, stuck my trainers on and just ran from my house. Um, when was this? How old, how old were you? Like I was, when? I must have been in my late 20s. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was about six, seven years ago. And I ran, took, put a bit of money in my pocket in case I wanted to stop for a drink. Because I didn't want to carry anything while I was running, yeah. and uh, yeah, it turned out I ran for 22 miles, <laughs> like in a huge loop. I didn't realise how far it was till I did it afterwards. The last five miles was agony. Oh, my wow. IT bands were pulling <laughs> and my knees were hurting, and I realised I had a newfound respect for people that ran a marathon, no matter what time you ran it in, because yeah, completing it completing it is, is a feat in itself. And I never used to think that. I used to think it would be easy to run at a slow pace and run a marathon. It's not at all. It's really difficult to complete 26 point whatever miles. And um, yeah, so that's always something I've, I've wanted to do. Um, and yeah, mm. as you say, when you finish playing, you get to do some stuff that you might not that you've been able yeah. to do. You've Marathon's put on not on my list. It's not on my list. <laughs> no, no, no. cheering no. you on that. <laughs> no. Yeah. We can sort your golf swing out as well. <laughs> Get the baby oh, fade working oh, again. Oh, baby fade, yeah. I'll be on the golf course as much as you <laughs> um, Best swing in golf, but no, he can't score, can you? Nah. nah. <laughs> Left, He's got the right. prettiest swing. Nah. Um, I just can't hit it straight, can I? No, Jesus. it's a shame. But um, no, it's, it's, I think this is a great topic, to be honest. I mean, there's there's a lot a lot we could talk about, a lot we could talk about mm. within within the life after professional professional sport in general. Um, it's a great topic. Um, anything else you want to add? Anything else you think that we need to, to discuss? I mean, I'm, I just I'm think, stuck for any more ideas right now. I just think at the end of your career you should be at kind of peace with yourself that you've given everything yep. that you can I feel like for me I've struggled a bit the last few years almost because I've dropped down the rankings so much you're kind of always pushing and pushing thinking I should be doing better I need and putting too much pressure on yourself when I think you need to be a bit more realistic and just look at what you've done in your career have I tried my best yes and if you're happy with that there's nothing more you can ask for really yeah um, like a no regrets type yeah. thing like it's, you've done all you can yeah done all you yeah. can you've got you've got a, you've, you've hit some of the goals you wanted to hit yeah you've got a, a good list of achievements and you've you've as you say you've given everything you can to be the best that you can and I think most of us would would say that for ourselves I, I'd like to think as a professional athlete yeah for sure yeah I think I could have done a lot better but it would have taken a lot more sacrifices, I think. If I look, yeah, if I look back, I'd like to. I'd love to have changed a few things. Just, I'd interested to see whether it would have made a massive difference or not. In in early days, 
um, just mid, mid career type stuff. Just or? you know, we talked about the academies, and I chose not to go up to Manchester, and and it would have been interesting to see what life would be like in an academy mm. with like a support team around you. I've never had that. I haven't really had a you know. My dad coached me when I was younger, and I had a few different coaches, but yeah. throughout a pro career, I've pretty much coached myself. Yeah, which again has been my choice, but it'd be interesting to see what it'd be like. To have a relation, proper relationship with a with a coach that works with you every day. Yeah. You know, not every day, but like every week, every week, yeah. every week. And my dad's been there the whole time, but we, you know, I haven't been on court with him for, you know, seven eight years. Yeah, uh, done a proper session. So, yeah, that's that's always something that there's always going to be. I think there's always going to be little regrets. And then other people regrets. would say the opposite. Perhaps some people become too centralised, too coached, and wish they'd have mm. maybe been a bit more individual. Yeah, exactly. And there's definitely yeah. always two sides two sides to the story. And you know, I always. You always think, could I have trained better or could I mm. train harder? And, you know, I, may, I might be, because I'm a bit older now, I might have forgotten actually I, I did train really, really hard when I was in my mid-20s, really hard. And, mm. you know, you forget yeah. that now when you're not training as hard and you're thinking, yeah. come on, yeah. I should be yeah. training harder. Yeah. When actually, no, no, you're using your brain and you're trying to rest at the right times and keep yeah. fresh as yeah. a 35-year-old. So maybe, right. I'm, maybe I'm being hard on myself, but, you know, you always want more. Yeah, and you've got to be realistic when you say, like, you're looking at, we're going to miss the adrenaline of being on that show call. Like, I'll definitely miss that. But at the same time, it's like, at times I think I don't necessarily deserve that. I'm probably not putting in the day-to-day work at the club as someone like Noran Gohar is because I don't mm. have if I'm honest I don't have the same motivation levels as I did when I was 25 yeah when which I was is fair playing. enough yeah so you can't get too disappointed if you put in a bad performance and you're like well honestly do I work as hard as whoever Noran Gohar and, and if if you don't then you, there's no point getting, getting, getting in the yeah, yeah. Like you don't deserve it yeah true okay let's wrap up this topic it was a, a really really interesting one um I hope you all there, listeners, found it interesting. Please leave us your feedback. I'd love to hear what you think about life after professional sport. Onwards. So the next topic has come about because Cameron has just suggested it. <laughs> Please enlighten us, Cameron. Yes. Um, well, the next topic is relationships and friends on tour. Um, all of us have been on tour for... I'm 17 years, Jen. Probably about the same. About the same. No, less. Bobby, 14. 14. You did uni. Yeah. Got your smarts on. <laughs> um, and obviously, we've made a lot of friends over the years. Different countries, squash players, non-squash players, club players, various tournament cities. Um, so we thought it'd be a good topic to touch upon. Definitely, squash. I think is a massively social game, amateur level and to an extent pro level. So everyone always enjoys sharing a beer in the bar with with people they've played with or you know visiting teams etc so being such a social game i actually think it's a good 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 topic to talk mm. about because i've i've made loads of friends on tour and it's one of the one of the reasons why i enjoy coming to tournaments why i enjoy just just the obviously the camaraderie 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 um because on court it's definitely you know there are there are no friends on court no matter how good you friends you are off court um one of the toughest parts of that is obviously i found playing against like one of your best mates so pete barker was obviously a really good friend of mine still was a really good friend of mine but when he was on tour obviously shared with shared rooms with him and, and playing him was one of the hardest things because you know i, I didn't want to be the one to beat him or send him home and, and vice versa so that was for me that was always the toughest part of having friendships on tour was then having to play against them um might be different you know you you guys i mean with rach much you have to play against <laughs> each other in a different rach. type of friendship i mean it's i was actually thinking of um al Alison oh Walters. yeah Alison so for you yeah of very course similar to yep. you and pete um similar ages best friends shared most tournaments um we somehow didn't really struggle on court being competitive with each other. <laughs> not in a, not in a um, bad way, but we've always had uh, really competitive matches. Fair, but uh, competitive. We didn't have too many problems if we beat each other. Um, always had respect and off court was the same afterwards. Um, so we actually always had good games. 
uh, rate, <laughs> Rachel Grinham is obviously slightly different. Um, that was a pretty strange one. Um, I'm very much more competitive than she is. Yeah. Weirdly, I think she's the only kind of extremely um, successful athlete or sports person I know or have heard of that isn't competitive. And in a weird way, I think that's actually helped her. So she's won everything in the game, but she's a really good loser. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Weirdly, I don't. So know she's that, relaxed. If yeah. She's, so she, she if it's close, she's like, she well, won, I don't mind if yeah, I win like or lose. She won. I think um, I speak for her, but when she won her first British Open, she wasn't seeded to, and I think she was playing. She played maybe Vanessa or Carol Owens and Cassie in the tournament, and they were all seeded above, and and she was just floating around playing the way she plays. Ended up winning it. And then went on to win three more. And it, once you've got that first one under your belt, um, it's obviously the pressure's off. And I actually remember playing her. Uh, we were together and I was sort of top five in the world. She was probably top five as well. And it was the semi-finals of the British Open in Manchester. So a massive match. Yeah, massive. She's already won three. Can I just... <laughs> <laughs> like, just, just point that I'm out. I'm like yeah. chomping at the bit to win a major title. Let me win! Yeah. yeah still, still great something. So I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I'll take it lost. So yeah. Nicole David at the time was like number one, streets yeah. ahead, won everything. She lost to Madders, Madeleine Perry, which was like shock result ever. So she She'd gone out in the quarters, and maybe I was even two seed. So I'm like rubbing yeah. my hat, like salivating. Yeah, like, this is my this chance. Is yeah, this has yeah. opened is up it. here. Yeah. Me and Rach in one semi final, and Al and Madders in the other semi final. I'm thinking, come on, this is your chance. Play Rach, lose 3 1, I think. It was. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and no. I'm like, came yeah. off, I'm just livid, not with her, but just like so disappointed. It came off. That for all the juniors out there, do not follow my lead. But I've, I've smashed a couple of rackets at oh, that time. This was a particularly bad one. Smashed my racket and it was at the National Centre in Manchester. Put it in, I walked off, smashed it, put it in a bin, went back, sat down near the track. DP, my coach at the time, well, he's still my coach, <laughs> and my stepfather, which doesn't help either, uh, walks, I can see him walking across the track, picks my Prince racket out, walks all the way back across, just drops it at my feet. Oh, no. Walks off. No, it's just like... Didn't say, anything, <laughs> didn't say anything. Didn't, didn't need to say anything, yeah. And, yeah, it's definitely a weird dynamic. So, and Rach went on to win win the final, got her fourth British Open, so I was over the moon for her. But yeah, losing that semi-final, there was definitely like a childlike kind of... Does she ever bring it up? No. I'm like, <laughs> like, we joke about it. I'm like, can you just give me what? Yeah, yeah, like, you're not three. even that bothered. Yeah, you're not that bothered <laughs> about it. Yeah. I'd give my left arm to win a British Open. <laughs> Who did she beat in the final? Who won the other uh, semi? She beat Madders. Madders so, beat Al in the other semi. Yeah, Madden yeah. beat Al in the semi. And interesting. Rach has always done well against she's got a lot better record against Madders I kind of thought if Madders gets to the final Rach will win if Al yeah. gets to the final it might be different yeah um, yeah. But yeah opened up and she wouldn't let me win uh, yeah, so did. on all off court things she, like if you play a board game or you play cards or something she's she's kind of she wants to win but she's not that bothered yeah she just winds me up though so <laughs> this is the only time we fall out is playing <laughs> board games board games yeah that's the same Scrabble with, oh. and Ikea we don't go well in Ikea actually <laughs> <laughs> exactly we have a similar relationship my, Lucy my wife is the same the only times we argue Ikea and board games so, yeah so, really yeah how about you um, obviously Lena was on tour for yeah, a long time, we, we, so we how never was got, that dynamic? never got to play each other in a yeah. tournament. Show Did that. you find it hard? Play, like, how were your stress levels <clears> when you'd watch Lena play and um, vice Yeah, they were pretty high, actually. you were pretty chilled in general. Yeah. I like to think I don't get stressed out about too much, but then, yeah, once, once I was watching Lena, or even worse, if I had to coach Lena... <laughs> Honestly, I'm sweating. <laughs> like if if it's a close match, obviously if it's close, it's worse. I'd just be sweating, like just just getting like butterflies in my stomach. Yeah. Jeez. And then, oh, we we had some interesting moments. If see if if she was coaching me, um, she, I'll say on court she gets pretty fiery. Yeah. Like she'll get fired up, and uh, yeah, you've played her. She yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, a few days, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So she gets fired up on court, but then when she's coaching, I don't know if she's coached you at all, but um, she's off court, she's so calm, like so calm and collected. So when she speaks to me between games, it didn't matter who I've played, I actually loved it. Like it was just one or two little simple things and that's, that's how I'd like to be coached anyway. Yeah. Um, so she coached me 
when I made the final of Hong Kong in 2015. Yeah, I remember, because on the squash TV, you could see her in the seat. At yeah, the she's just sitting there by her herself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she, she coached me all the way through that tournament, and she coached me to the final in the World Series finals in, in Dubai. So She's a good coach then. Yeah, mm, I mean, there yeah. you go. Like Maybe she can make a bit of money playing yeah. Uh, yeah. coaching. Yeah. Uh, but then if I coached her between games, she'd rip my head off normally. <laughs> like, I'd, I'd say the wrong thing. and ah, What are you doing? Like, that's, that's not what you are. So, but funnily enough, um, your old man, yep. Bobby, um, Lena enjoyed getting coached by him. So I don't know if it's just because that relationship thing where it's just too close to home, yeah. literally too close to yeah. home. Yeah. Um, it can just take one little word or yeah. sentence from... Yeah, it could, could say exactly the same thing, but the fact it comes from yeah. someone else and, yeah. and also an actual coach, yeah, it could make a huge difference, I think. Definitely, yeah. Do you have that yeah. with your dad at all? My stepdad, DP, I, even if it's that close a relationship, the odd little thing can just switch you more than and someone you're not as close with. No, I, I choose, yeah, my, no, my dad's really, really good in between games. Mm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have anyone else, definitely not. Um, yeah, he's just really good. He's got a good guys. eye for the game. You're yeah, right. he's just mm. he's got a good eye. He's very calm, always very calm, and he always simplifies it. So he's always giving you one or two things. And for me, that's similar to Cameron, what Cameron said. That's all you really want. You don't want to be too. You one, you want to be calmed down, and then two, you want to just given one or two instructions. Which and he normally says the right things. So, um, so mm. yeah, yeah. Well, with friends, friends on tour, like. It's always it's nice, actually, to see friends helping other friends out, yeah. like in between yeah. games. It's an interesting dynamic, but you obviously see different sort of cliques appearing with different mm. countries, nationalities. not always the same. The girls is really interesting. A lot of the girls who are, like, good friends, I find some of the really good friendships, like, not surprising, but just it's nice, you know, like with Tesney and Joel, like, Tess really good Joel friends, aren't really they? Close, like, yeah. just... Um, that sort of coming from different sides of the of the planet, and that's a really nice story, you know, within within squash to show you that two people grown up completely opposite ends of the planet then become like really good friends f- yeah. through squash, mm. um, and you know, and it's nice to see different players helping each other out in between games because squash isn't a sport like we've talked about with tennis where you always have an entourage with you and always have your coach able yeah. to have your coach with you, so. It's you nice know, to it's have some sort of companionship, isn't it? Definitely and in between understanding games. Understanding that you're both doing the same, same thing, traveling yeah. the world. Mm, it's a lonely sure. place if you don't have at least one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I just feel grateful that you know squash is such a great sport where you do meet great people and, and make some really, really good friends that should you know last a lifetime. So yeah. I think that's a, that's a good little topic yeah. to just touch on, really. So we get to everyone's favourite bit of the show after the boring chat that we've already had. This is what I'm really here for. uh, This is what Jen's (laughs) here for. She's just sat up straight. This is Bobby's quiz. This is my strength. Come on, we need the music. We forgot music last week. It's just so bad. Go on. Oh, that's it. Oh, is that it? Okay, fine. (laughs) Okay, so this this is Bobby's quiz. And as we have a guest, we're going to mix it up a little bit. And this is going to be head to head. Oh, Cameron versus it. Jenny. Okay, so last two weeks we've done very, uh, you know, around squash. So I didn't want to completely lose that, but there isn't any squash questions in here. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to travel around the world through different destinations that we play at on tour. This could be embarrassing. And <laughs> oh my God. at each stop, I'm going to ask a question. So wow. the questions are going to be ones that... I would say you would have almost no chance of getting the correct answer. For <laughs> but that means I'm a, whoever, I'm a goer. whoever is closest will win the round. There's six rounds, and I actually have a tiebreaker question in case we need it. What in case it ends I'm up at zero? Sure all? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Someone has to win the round. Oh, okay. I oh, closest. Gotcha. Okay. Closest. Yeah. 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 I can un- I can explain more if you need. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, the first question. Of Bobby's quiz yeah, is, just, just to confirm. Just to confirm. Do we is, do we jump in? So or, I'm, I'm no, expecting no, no. a buzzer or no, something. No, there's no buzzer. Or there's no it, buzzer. There's no lights. There's no there's no horns. Or is it like ladies apart first? Yes, and then we're going to start with Jenny, Jenny first in the first round. Then we're going to alternate. So okay. Jenny's going to go first this time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. We got it. I'm not confident. I feel like it's going to be like facts and figures related. It's very facts and figures <laughs> oh, no, related. I'm terrible with numbers. Jenny, don't worry. <laughs> just relax. Enjoy. Okay. Game on. So. The distance oh, no. 
travelled, if you fly from London to Doha. So Doha is a stop that we have on the world tour. Unfortunately, not for the women at the moment, but have been in the past. So Doha is Qatar. I so London, that. and I want it in kilometres. Oh, uh, what? Please. And this is whoever's closest. Can, can we, I am totally going to shame myself. Can we give it in miles? Like, you know, frequent... Mate, I haven't, I've got it written down in kilometres. What should we do? I go just Google miles. miles. No, you get your statement, frequent flyer miles. It's only miles. Would you like to go first on this one? No, I don't actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's whoever's closest. Okay, okay. So oh. even... Kilometres. Jen, your guess is n- <clears throat> might not influence Cameron's, although well, it probably will. I'm terrible at this. Um, well, it's all good saying, but th- Harrogate about- to London is about 200. <laughs> this is there's a start. Right, please talk me through your logic uh, here. This I'm, is good. No. Okay, here um, we go. How many Harrogates to London's are there in London to Doha? I, I feel like I'm back at school in a maths <laughs> exam. Oh, it is sort dear. of. They're not all. They're not all. Um, they're not all lies. Don't worry. They're all similar. I don't know. Ten thousand kilometres. Okay, fair guess. Cameron, ten thousand k's is your guess. Yeah. London to Doha. By the way, there's people shouting at the podcast going, oh my God, how should this? <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> 10,000 Ks. Firstly, go more or less. Well, what's... If you just go one Come on, over talk us through your logic. Well, yeah, what, what's, I, want to, I want you to talk okay. us through your logic. because talk you through it. Yeah, because this is a podcast. We don't want the silence bits where, you're, where, you, where your brain's ticking. Okay, you know? my first thought was miles to kilometres. What's Is that like 1.6? Yeah, ish. About... Got a calculator on you? Well, you're not allowed to use a calculator. <laughs> Come on. Uh, okay, let's see. 10,000K. Uh, how many... Okay, can I say how many hours does it take to fly from London? Because I, I fly from Copenhagen. How many hours does it take to fly from... Oh, do, you want, do you want me to tell you? Yeah. Oh, it's about... Is it like, six, on, is it like five minute. hours? Six hours? Six and a half. <laughs> huh? well, it's about six and a half hours, isn't it? What's your answer? We've <laughs> <laughs> not got all day. Um, yeah. I'll go 7,000k. Okay. Pilly wins round one. Boom! What was the answer? The answer is 5,240. Oh, dear. So I was only... <laughs> close then. <laughs> Not far That's away, Jen. That's my least favourite kind of question. Not far away. Are they all going to be like this? Right. Um, similar. Oh. Um, Mark it down, please. Cameron, one. But don't worry, Cameron's going first on the next one. So Cameron, one, nil. Well done. Um, okay, so the next place we're going to is Hong Kong. Pass. Hong Kong. <laughs> so yeah, I'll give you, uh, I've learned a few bits in my research. So Hong Kong has the most amount of skyscrapers in the world. Well, interesting. Mm. How many skyscrapers, which is to define a skyscraper, a building over 100 meters tall? Okay. How many skyscrapers are there in Hong Kong? Ooh. Wow. Good question. That yeah. is a good question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that. Because obviously we've been there a lot. You've yep. seen Hong Kong yeah, a lot. I've counted them every time I go. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> just... <laughs> From the just sat there. From the peak tram. <laughs> yeah. oh, another seven have gone up this yeah, year. Oh. Yeah. And uh, the whole of Hong Kong. In not the whole just, obviously, we're, we're downtown, so there's yeah. quite a lot there. But we're talking, there's obviously a lot of flats and stuff around the outside. So Hong Kong has the most... I mean, 100 metres is pretty streets. tall, so it might not be necessarily all flats. Come on, okay, come on. Talk us through your logic. Uh, for, the, for this one, I'm just picturing Hong Kong yeah. where I've walked yeah. around and... Yeah. Fair enough. I got the top of the, the peak there and have a look down and it was quite cloudy that day so I couldn't see <laughs> um, I'm going to say, I mean, this could be... <laughs> you could be a shocking question. I'm oh, gonna, come on, this is great questions. I'm going to go with, um, in the whole of Hong Kong, Yeah. I'm going to go with... <laughs> come See, on. This, I've got a number in my head, but I think this Too could be way off. No, just, yeah. just, just say it. It's, it's 180. Just... Fine. I Fine. wouldn't 100... go that high. But I... uh, I'd take it down or not? Just that... In the whole of Hong Kong. I know, but the whole of Hong Kong is not that big. Both sides. <laughs> Kowloon and Hong Kong. <laughs> it's very, very. I'm trying to picture dense. 100 metres put, track. Put it, in put, a it put, <laughs> put, <laughs> put it this way. It's got more than New York. A oh, lot wow. more than New York. Buildings over 100 metres. Oh, this is stressful. Um, you've gone 150. I've, I've got no 180. 180, 180 I've sorry. Got 180. Good, good start. <laughs> <laughs> more than 20? 20, yeah. Yeah, good uh, guess. 20. I was, was thinking under 180, 
Yeah. But you're leaning me with your New York. Leaning? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm a very impartial quiz master. <laughs> um, but I was. I reckon I'm bang on. I'm going to go. I reckon I'm bang on. You're not bang on. No. Um, it's against my gut instinct, but I'm going to go 200. You're right to go against your gut because you win the round because yes. you're closest. <laughs> But you're both absolutely country miles off. No. Keep going. What is it like? No way. Is it like eight hundred? Keep going. Thousand. Keep going. What? Two thousand. No, no, not that. <laughs> <laughs> One thousand three hundred and three. No way. That's true. Yep. Wow. And I guessed a hundred and eighty. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky Jenny didn't go first on that round. Oh, boom. Boom. Jenny I'm good at wins geography. the round. Just, one all. You're all right. good at geography, just okay. Not facts and figures. Jenny, you'll be pleased to know the next question. Stitch myself there. No, no, no. <laughs> We're moving to the Gold Coast. Oh. Hong Kong mm. to the Gold Coast, which is where we will all be competing at the Commonwealth Games. So, Gold Coast. Okay. Here's the question, and it's going to be Jenny to answer first. How many days per year is there sunshine on the Gold Coast? Well, it's so, a sunshine state. Exactly. So this is the official from the weather, not Michael Fish, but someone equivalent Euro, of Euro it in, in Australia. Weather stats. Yeah. Um, the, How the many official days a year are there sunshine? Is, is, is it sunshine? Sun? I don't know over a certain amount of hours per day, but how many days are there sunshine? Is it su- sunny, basically, in on the Gold Coast per year? It must be. So 300, 365 yeah. is a max. Obviously, it's not every day. Because... <laughs> You will get sun every day. But. but. So, yeah. It does get a bit cloudy. It gets a bit stormy. Yeah, there you go. Um, you do get storms on the Gold Coast. True. So, um, uh, this is a good question because obviously you live there or near yeah. and Cameron, obviously the same. You do. Yeah. Obviously not now. Below so, board, both yeah. of you, sh- I'm hoping both of you are going to get pretty close to this one. <laughs> a bit closer than the last sh- one. This is definitely should be Philly's fault. I reckon I could have a good crack at this. Okay. Jenny, Jenny's going first anyway. So. Well, I'm from England, so I kind of think it's sunny every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go 300. Okay. Can we say, if we if we guess the exact number, yep. any of these, yep. is that an extra point? Yep, extra because point. Because that's, that's pretty yep. impressive, isn't it? extra point. 300. It's, it's very impressive, actually. <laughs> so you, you're going 300. Yeah. 300, okay. That's pretty decent. I'll go... 327. Ooh. Ooh. Is it close? The I answer does end with a seven. I bet it's in between. Unfortunately. 287. It's not in between. Is it 287? Is it Did you see my notes? No, I didn't. <laughs> I get a bonus point. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Jenny wins the round. 287 it, is the answer. 287. 287. I thought it was way sunnier. 287. Not a bad second guess. Very good. Yeah. So, 287. So, so new local, new local in Queensland. Jeez. Take, so, take you've been out of the country too long, Phil. Yeah. I've got to get back there. I'll be back there very soon. <laughs> 2 1 takes the lead. Yeah, Pilly's going down. Um, is there a prize, by the way? Yes, there is a prize. A very special prize. Mm. Speedboat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how. Okay, we're on to, so Gold Coast. Okay. We're going to San Francisco. Yeah. Going around the world. I like San Fran. Yeah. So, we've both been there. Yep. San Fran. Not often, but, but yeah. But you have been there. It won't help you with the answer to this question anyway. <laughs> So, how many people live in downtown San Francisco? Not the whole Bay Area, just downtown. Population questions are not my forte. No. Okay, well, you need this one because you see one down. <laughs> <laughs> how many questions? What do we got? Six? Yep, six. This is okay. question four. Okay, downtown San Fran. Yep. I mean, I have absolutely no idea. I don't even know what downtown San Fran consists of. No, me neither. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Get stuck in. Downtown. Downtown. What? As soon as you cruise out of the city, it's just... I mean, how many people live downtown? No, I don't know. That's the question. That's the question. Stop asking me. It's just all shops and stuff, isn't it? Well, no, there's, there's people who live sort of above, above them as well. Oh, my God. Um, million. Okay. It's actually uh, it's a decent guess. Decent. I, 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 I just, I'll put that out. Throw there. it out there and say it's a decent guess. Decent. It's a decent yep. guess. I'm gonna go under. No idea. Obviously. Um, 
downtown San Fran. Downtown. Harrogate's got about 60,000. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's in comparison There's to like Harrogate. How many Harrogate's got fit in San <laughs> <laughs> Whatever San Fran downtown is. Um, <clears throat> 750,000. 750. Good guess. 830,000. That's me. Oh, Jenny <laughs> takes it. <laughs> No, isn't there more than a million? I thought that was a little bit conservative. You know? I'm glad that I like it when you go first. Cause <laughs> yeah, because you're, you're way off what I'm you thinking. Can say, <laughs> you could say one less than my guess. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, from San Francisco, we are going to New York. Nice. Um, this one, I actually feel, is the easiest question. Oh, here we go. And, and this is, it is definitely the easiest question. So, New Yorkers... That is a great accent. <laughs> Drink more coffee than anywhere else in America. But how many times more than the average American do New Yorkers drink? Mm. So how many more times? They do love a coffee. Yeah. Um, than oh, the so average you, American. Yeah, so it's Jenny, Jenny needs to go first. But obviously, how many more times? So it's not going to be a thousand because it's, it's a small number, smallish number. You can guess a thousand if you want. Yeah. Go, go thousand. I'm not that bad. Thousand, thousand times more. I will thousands. go higher. <laughs> um, how many times more than the average American? Just they do New love coffee. Drink. How many times they? more? Quite highly strung. Yeah. No like offense to any New no. Yorkers. <laughs> They're so offended right city. now. It is hectic. Yeah. I drink a few coffees when I'm in New York. Mm. Yeah. I think people uh, just generally drink more coffee do, in New York. Yeah. 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 That's part of it as well. The culture of it. <laughs> I had a figure, but I'm not. Got instinct. Yeah, how I many usually times go more with than the average gut. American? So the average American city, like how many more times is New York over those? What What was your gut instinct? What do you, What do you? My gut was eleven, but I think it's going to be more. I'll go with my gut. Go with your gut. Eleven. Eleven times more. No, okay. oh, well, I've done it now, so I think it's more. 11. No, sorry, Stick that's your 11. final guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, more. I, I think it's I think it's going to be more. In which case, I'll say twelve times more. Oh, that's just cheating. Yeah. That's <laughs> not fair. You sure you want to? I'm sure. To I'm sure it's more. That's sneaky, though. You could, At least go like eighteen or twenty. Or something. Uh, who's, who's, what, what's it? I'm just waiting for the final answer. Yeah, final answer. You're going final answer. Yeah. So it's getting. He needs a win here. Yeah, exactly. So he's, he's pulling out the tactics. Well, the tiebreaker's gone out the window. Oh! What is it? It's seven. Oh! <laughs> Easy. It's an absolute battering. No way. Get it's an absolute in. battering. I've been. Well, smashed. At least I've got one win today. Four one. <laughs> <laughs> Four one. Well, we'll do the last question anyway. Okay. What um, were you thinking? In uh, you know, you said your gut instinct was eleven. Yeah. What were you thinking? Were you thinking like twenty times? I was thinking 11 and then I thought only because Daz said it was a small figure or small-ish yeah. Yeah. I thought maybe it might be like 15 or yeah. 15 yeah, I was thinking 18. like 15 to 20 like, more times than the average at first city. I thought well, five, I was thinking about five times more yeah, that would have been a good guess mm. but anyway <laughs> <laughs> from New York we move on to the last city which is Hull oh. what do you mean oh. all? So, nothing I love Yorkshire that's where I'm exactly <laughs> I've actually grown to love Hull um so, Hull. There was quite a lot of different interesting facts about Hull, believe it or not. Really? Jeez. Believe it or not. But um, the Hull Fair, which is the Hull Travelling Fair, which is a very, very famous fair. Never heard of it. No, no neither have I. <laughs> when did it start? It's one of, the old, lo- one of the oldest fairs ever in the world. Oh, this is on me, isn't it? You're... When did it start? We'll keep it brief because... The quiz is over yeah. and you've lost. But so even if I get a bonus, still. Just to save well, yeah, actually, some actually, actually face really yeah, good. you can't really draw, can you? <laughs> two two bonus points if I guess it. Yeah, I'll give you two bonus points if you get if you get the right year. If you get the right year. so what year? Yeah. Did they start or did they form? Yeah. It's been going a long time. And what do you say? It's the oldest. One of the oldest one of traveling fairs in the world. Yeah. In Hull. This this could be anything. Yeah. I'll say... <laughs> how, how, how many hundreds of years are you thinking? Uh, were well, people alive then? Uh, <laughs> that's how old I'm going. <laughs> um, 
Oh. Whatever you say, I'm just going to do one year out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going bang on. I'm getting this. Come on. Um, you got it. Have you? I'll go... I just really want him just to say the 18, exact time. 1884. Okay. I'm going to go... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I won't go one. one. I'm going to go older. Um... I'm going to go... Interesting. 1812. 1812. Jenny wins another round. I'm getting chopped. Absolutely chopped. 5-1. I've not got enough space on the page. What was the answer? 1278. 1278. 310 BC. (laughs) That is nearly the end of Bobby's quiz, but I'm going to do the tiebreaker anyway. Okay. 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 So what I would have asked as a tiebreaker question, if you'd got anywhere near, mm. um, would have been, how many titles have each of you won? And I want you to answer, answer the opposite person's Ooh, amount. Okay. I reckon so, it might be similar. So, Jenny, if you were going for, going first because uh, you just battered him, yeah, so you, you, you've yeah. got more right answers, yeah. so it's, it's fair. So how many, how might, many PSA might, titles has Cameron won? I should won? give a high number just to give you a bit, <laughs> a bit of confidence. Is that 40-something? <laughs> <laughs> how many have you won? He's about to well, retire. This, is, this could be awkward, couldn't it? Okay, so we've been on, we've been on tour think exactly the same amount of years. Yeah. I think we're yeah. Sim, similar-ish. Yeah, okay. I'm thinking similar. <laughs> oh, <laughs> interesting. In my go first. You'll go. Um, She'll go first. How many? How many PSA we... titles has Cameron won? Oh, I mean, not many. Horror- He's better. Go <laughs> is he better than wrong. you think, or not as good as you think? <laughs> <laughs> None in the last oh, five years. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Memory doesn't go back that far. Same for me. Same for me. Too shit. Um, oh, oh, oh. I think I we may have won more actually. I don't know. What number? Uh, Come on, Jen. Ooh. Come on, six one. We want <laughs> twelve. Oh. Do you know your <laughs> I think I know the answer. Yeah, <laughs> it's close. Um, I'll say sure. I'll say thirteen for you. It's generous. I think. Do you know the answer to yours? I think Tell me I you know the answer because I haven't researched this. I was hoping oh. you both knew. Oh, in that case, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, yours is, mine's like eleven. I think mine's thirteen. Yours is thirteen. Yeah. Wait, and did I say? No, no, you said 12. Oh, you said 12 for me. But I thought we were going to be exactly the same because I thought you might have... Yours is 13. Mine, 13. I think, is 11. I couldn't find out because they won't let me on the female side of the, the site. Uh, is that so. 100%? Are you, you're pretty sure. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Final yeah. final answer. Yeah. So you were two away. Gem was one away. Oh, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> head, head in hands. Head in hands oh, he's head. gone so bad at this Blowing at you out of the water. Six somehow. one. <laughs> Six I wasn't one. confident at the start with the guitar. Ten thousand. <laughs> it 000 wasn't 000 a good start for you, Jen. After that, but after that, it was complete domination. <laughs> I was a shoo in after that first answer. You had been bigging yourself up yeah, off know. air as well before I know. the quiz. I have to say, he said how well he's done in the yeah. last few quizzes. So, the end of Bobby's quiz today, and it's been complete annihilation. <laughs> mm. Pilly is almost crying. Really brought me back down to earth. <laughs> I mean, I'm shattered. Congratulations, <laughs> our guest. Jenny is the victor today. So we come to the end of another Comments from the Couch podcast. I hope you've all enjoyed today's show. It's been an absolute pleasure to have Jenny with us today. Our first guest. Jenny, did you enjoy yourself? I certainly did, especially Bobby's quiz, I have to say. Worst part of the show today. <laughs> it was brilliant. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. Lovely to have you on. Um, Honoured to have you on as our first first guest. So it's been it's been great. Cameron? Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed the podcast up until <laughs> the last 10 minutes. But Fair it's been enough. a pleasure once again. And Jen, thanks for coming on awesome first guest so everyone listening let us know what you thought to today's podcast let us know if you enjoyed us having a guest and and any guests that you'd like us to have on in future um check us out we will be on itunes soon i promise um but for now that's the end of another comments from the couch ciao ciao